2 Samuel chapter 13 from your authorized version of the scriptures. Please get your copy of the authorized version. Please read along with me. Read along with me because I make mistakes and you need to see and hear what we're looking at today. Read along with me. Be a Berean. Okay? Be a Berean. Search the scriptures daily whether these things be so. Okay? Please read along with me. 2 Samuel 13, verses 1 and verse 5. And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. And Amnon, Amnon was so vexed that he felt sick for his sister, Tamar, for she was a virgin, and Amon thought it hard to for him to do anything to her. Now, Tamar and Amon, Amnon were half brother and sister. Okay, they were not, you know, they had the same father, but they did not have the same mother. Okay, they did not. All right, but nonetheless. Nonetheless, in the law, in the book of Leviticus, it is prohibited for half-siblings um, to lie with one another. Okay? All right? We, we've talked about that. Uh, oh, uh, be fruitful and multiply. Uh, we talked about how the, the, uh, the uh, gene pool was pure at the beginning. The link for that will be in the description box for you, so don't even go there, okay? Link for it will be in the description box. Alright? But this is prohibited. Okay? This is no bueno. Alright? And just give me a second there, brother. Okay. Yeah, Alright, there we go. But Amnon had a friend. A friend. <laughs> yeah. 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 A friend that helped him along in his sin. Kind of like these antinomianist people, okay? <laughs> friend, yeah. But Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man, very subtle. Okay, and uh, there is a video that we, we uh, look into subtle as well. Okay, uh, I'll try to find it if I can remember. Okay, and he said unto him, Why art thou, being the king's son, lean from day to day? Wilt thou not tell me? And Amnon said unto him, I love Tamar, my brother Absalom's sister. And it says in verse 4, uh, verse 2, that she was his sister as well. Remember, they were half-siblings. And Jonadab said unto him, What should have Jonadab done? But remember, he was a very subtle man. Crafty, smooth, you know, spake like a dragon, I bet. Well, what was he, you know, he should have been like, Dude, you know, there are plenty out there for you, a young, handsome guy like yourself, I'm just assuming. Oh, uh, what you, what you bothered with your, that, ew. But what does Jonadab do? And Jonadab said unto him, Lay thee down on thy bed and make thyself sick. And when thy father cometh to see thee, say unto him, I pray thee, let my sister Tamar come, and give me meat, and dress the meat in my sight, that I may see it and eat it at her hand. Mm, kind of like a lame duck theory kind of thing going on. Okay. Skip down now to verse 10. Okay? Skip now to verse 10. And we will read on to verse 15. Now, Amnon, go ahead and read the context on your own time. Amnon lays down and pretends to be sick. And Tamar, a good, godly woman. Tamar, godly woman. If you're a brother who has a Tamar as a helpmeet, you are a blessed man. You are a blessed man. Uh, the body of Christ could... And they're out there where? I don't know. 
But the body of Christ for the Tamars out there, <laughs> you dear sisters, okay? I know of a few. Actually, I do. I know of a few. But, and Amnon said unto Tamar, Bring the meat into the chamber, that I may eat of thine hand. And Tamar took the cakes which she had made, and brought them into the chamber to Amnon her brother. And when she had brought them unto him to eat, he took hold of her, and said unto her, Come, lie with me, my sister. Here we go. Tamar, I, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. And she answered him, Nay, my brother, do not force me. For no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not thou this folly. Damn, Ammon was about to rape his half-sister. The term rape doesn't come in. I know that, but, okay? And I, whither shall I cause my shame to go? And as for thee, thou shalt be as one of the fools in Israel. Stop right there. Look at the, the process of thought of Tamar. Concern for herself? Absolutely. Her, her half-brother was about to forcefully lay with her. Lie with her. Okay? But she also had wherewithal to be like, and hey, look at you, you know, you, you do this, think about yourself too, pal. Godly woman. Godly woman. Uh, I mean, if you're a brother out there and your wife exhibits, your help me exhibits the qualities of a Tamar, you, you are a blessed man. You are a blessed man. And you have favor of the Lord. Amen. 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 You sisters. You sisters in Christ. Tamar. Okay. Godly woman. Godly woman. Continuing in verse 13. Now therefore, now and look at how she does this. Now therefore I pray thee, speak unto the king, for he will not withhold me from thee. You could argue that was a ploy on her part, but I actually believe that she was being sincere. You know, a ploy meaning like doing anything, saying anything that she can to, um, to get away from the situation. Okay, let's continue. Howbeit he would not hearken unto her, but being stronger than she, forced her and lay with her. Now remember... Amnon, Amnon, or was it Amnon? Verse 3, and Amnon was so vexed it because he loved her. This love, okay? <laughs> this love, all right? This love. Verse 2, and Amnon was so vexed it that he fell sick for his sister Tamar. For she was a virgin, and Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. And along comes subtle little jo uh, Jonadab. But the, hey, why don't you feign yourself sick? Get her in here. That way you lower the defenses and then grab her. And, okay? So, so far in Amnon, we see obviously lust. Obviously, the word lust is not in, in the context. But, okay, we also see concupiscence. We also see a form of covetousness. Okay? And we also see a consuming. Because there was burning involved, obviously. Obviously. Because he felt sick. And it consumed him. It engulfed him. It obsessed him, you could say. Hold on. Let's continue. Now, verse 15. So, Amnon got his way. He was so consumed with love for his half-sister, Tamar. Ew. He exhibited lust, concupiscence, covetous, covetousness, willing to do anything without even thinking properly about it, and his half-sister Tamar in verse 13, it's like, whoa, 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 dude, okay? But he didn't listen. Why? Because he was thinking with one thing, 
can't get that loan. But he got what he wanted. And God granted their request, but sent leanness into their soul. You, beloved, better be very careful what you wish for. I, I often praise the Lord that he has not, <laughs> praise the Lord, has not given me everything that I've ever wanted. Praise the Lord. God forbid. God forbid that our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, granted me personally everything that I ever wanted. Verse 15. This love. Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he hated her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said unto her, Arise, be gone. And let's be adults here. I'm not going to say anything on verse 15. But those of you who know when you have a lust, when you have evil concupiscence, when you covet, when you allow something to consume you, burn you to where it drives your thoughts, and then you get it, and then you have your thing. What happens afterward? Hmm? And and let's read to eighteen because really gotta really gotta show what kind of a, a godly woman Tamar was. You you dear sisters out there, bless your hearts. Uh, a woman who feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Amen. 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 But uh, for you sisters. And she said unto him. There is no cause. This evil in sending me away is greater than the other that thou didst unto me. But he would not hearken unto her. Verse 16 shows us lots of things there. Okay. He lay with his half sister. Okay. Now in God's eyes. That is an aspect onto a union of marriage. It is an aspect of it. Absolutely. Why do you think God wanted us to be virgins onto marriage? Okay. Well, that's a totally different subject. We're not going to get off on that right now. But uh, Tamar, godly woman. Godly woman. Okay. There was a consummation there whether Amnon thought so or not. Tamar, the godly woman godly woman. It's like, okay, you, you lay with me. You lied with me. You lay with me. Okay? Um, sending me, okay, I'm, I'm yours now. Okay? Remember, that's an aspect to it. Okay? That's an aspect to it. Okay? Um, she's like, I'm, I'm, I'm yours. Don't send me away. You send me away now, that's worse than what you did to me. But he would not hearken unto her. And she said unto him, There is no cause. This evil in sending me away is greater than the other that thou didst unto me. But he would not hearken unto her. Then he called his servant that ministered unto him and said, Put now this woman. Doesn't even address her as his half-sister. But put now this woman out from me. And bolt the door after her. And she had a garment of divers colors upon her. For with such robes were the king's daughters that were virgins apparel. Then his servant brought her out and bolted the door after her. Then she rents her clothes and puts them, okay? So on and so forth. Okay. okay, why did we look at this? Hmm. Obsession. Obsessed. thousand dollar challenge of money I don't have to any of you in the authorized version of the scripture find me obsess find me obsession in the scripture find it for me now what we think of the word obsession okay 
differs from what the original use of the word was was. And remember, when you have a perfect standard, the authorized version, this is where you begin when it comes with our language, I believe. Now, right away, straight out the gate, if you want if you're going to use the term obsess, obsession, is it a salvific issue? No, no. But if you're saying words are important. Words have meaning. Okay? For example, obsession. Uh, I gotta bring this up. Um, there, there's, there's this devil, the bloke of Blackpool, who um, is notorious, notorious for his obsession with other people. Meaning, th th that crazy devil, he'll make 101 videos about one dude. Okay? And he's notorious for this. Notorious. To where other people even say, uh, other his fellow brethren, you know, Chris Lynn brothers, who are all devils, okay, even say of this bloke of Blackpool that uh, he, he's obsessed, he's obsessed, okay. Even little Sugar Brits's uh, sweetheart, Franklin, has that kind of thing where he will make video upon video. He has a little bit more reserve, even though he's a devil uh, deceiving people, but the point is, okay, Elmer from New York. Okay, when it came in regards to his holiness from Maine, he, the, the guy was what we call, you know, modern, obsessed with his holiness because he did video upon video upon video upon video upon video of him. And, hey, let's, let's be, even his holiness from Maine was obsessed with Steven Anderson because he did video upon video upon video upon video upon video upon Steven Anderson. Okay? Now, obsess, obsession is not found in scripture. It is not, I'll give you a thousand dollars of money that I don't have if you can find it for me in scripture. Okay? Now, <laughs> this is a meaty video, by the way, okay? Got um, two dictionaries. Webster's 1828 Dictionary, okay? Which, uh, which is my go-to. But we also got this one, which is more modern. At least it's older than uh, the 1828, all right? Now, first we're going to look up obsess, obsession, in the modern dictionary, okay? Now, I don't have this, uh, okay, let me find it, hold on. Uh, it's right here, okay. Uh, da, 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 da. There it is, okay. From this Webster's New World Colleg College Dictionary. Uh, I think this one is from 1997, okay? A um, hundred years since Webster's 1828. Obsess in a mo more modern dictionary. And this is something that I encourage you to do. Compare dictionaries and see how language, euphemistic language, okay, wait, wait, wait my pen. <laughs> euphemistic language, okay, euphemistic language, all right, change the name of con the condition, you change the condition? Hmm. No. But you see how words change. That's why it's important that we have a perfect standard, okay? Language, words may change, but the way God intended a word to be used doesn't. You understand? That, see, this thing where words change in meaning, and they try to apply that to the perfect standard, that's a yea hath God said moment, okay? You understand? That's why, that's why, you know, have no respect, brethren, have no respect for someone who is a whore and goes to multiple multiple versions of the Bible to find the meaning. That, that's whorish. That's what you have God said. Okay? Like I said, you run into one of these Christians who at least would say something like, well, I believe that the ESV is the perfect standard. I'd have more respect for one of those guys than the other. Okay? But, getting ahead of myself, obsessed from a more modern dictionary. Obsessed. To haunt or trouble in mind, to abnormal to an abnormal degree, preoccupy greatly. And again, <laughs> the book of Blackpool is a perfect example of this. 
I mean, uh, you know, he that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Okay, hey, I've I've done, you know, three videos on Roma Downey, or not Roma Downey, that devil, but Roma's army and stuff like that. I will continue to say uh, and make mention of these devils, but not dedicating an entire video onto them, whereas these guys do. Okay, so, but yeah, that, that, that crazy idiot devil from the uh, block of Blackpool hidden in Lucifer's loins, okay? Um, those are all adjectives there, sweetheart. All right? Uh, <laughs> that's accurate, isn't it? Accurate. Obsession in a modern dictionary. Uh, the act of an evil spirit in possessing or ruling a person. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, with these coadjutors, with these, you know, these, you know, these Christians, the, the antinomianists, the Catholics, and the Pentecostals, you name it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Two, the fact or state of being obsessed with an idea, desire, emotion, etc. Such a, such a persistent idea, desire, emotion, etc. Especially one that cannot be gotten rid of. By reasoning. <laughs> these, these devils. This is, that, you know, that ought to have bloke of Blackpool written next to it. <laughs> and any of you who know to whom I'm referring, hey, hey, Franklin, sweetheart, come on there, sugar pie. Come on, even you got to admit that, you filthy devil. Even you got to admit that about your Christian brother. Come on now. Come on now, I know you got half a brain and you can expound a fly, you scripturally inept idiot. But you even got to acknowledge that there, sweetie pie. Huh? <laughs> okay? Even you got to do that. So, obsession, obsess. Now, here's something really interesting. Very, very interesting. From Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Now that we just, read, we just read was quite a prolonged definition, right? Words are important. Words have meaning. Obsess, obsession is not in Scripture. Okay? Obsess from Webster's 1828. Check this out. And with what I've mentioned about these devils, think about this. Obsessed from Webster's 1828 Dictionary to besiege. To besiege. That's it. <laughs> what? Uh, Latin obsidio absiris ab ad whatever. And it says right there, he says not used. But obsess. To besiege. Like someone trying to besiege a fortress. Oh, like trying to pull down strongholds or something, huh? Think about, think about that one, brethren. Think about that one. Obsession in Webster's 1828 Dictionary. The act of besieging. And... What Webster adds here is very, very interesting. The first attack of Satan, antecedent, ant, antecedent to possession. And he ties in Satan, the act of besieging, with obsession. <laughs> so, when you got these, these lovely devils, who, you know, uh, <laughs> uh, um, Elmer from New York, okay? Uh, even His Holiness from Maine, when the thing was Stephen Anderson. That, the devils trying to justify themselves, brought that up constantly. Well, hey, look what he... I, I, I do, I have to give a, a little credence to that, okay? All right, I, I do, I do. But, the point is, when these devils who will continually 
Make video, 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 video. Dedicate an entire thing. You know, besieging. Hmm. Fascinating, fascinating. So, so, you got these devils who get obsessed, have this obsession with the body of Christ and the saints. What are they doing? <laughs> the act of besieging. You know, Paul, the Lord Jesus Christ through Paul, our apostle, likens us onto soldiers. We are at war. We are at war. Okay? And the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. Scripture. But see, with the devils, like the ones I have made mention to, they, they use fleshly means to combat. So, the question which I posed to several brethren, saints, um, okay, so what is the scriptural equivalent to what the modern would call obsession? I think it's consumed. Now, let's be fair. Let's be fair. What does, cons uh, uh, actually, no, let's first, scripture first. Scripture first. All right, scripture first. We start with scripture, then we'll go to that, okay? Obsess, obsession is not in scripture. So, I think uh, there is a, in flame, uh, or wine inflame them, um, and several other things. I think scripturally consume. Because what happens when you, in modern phraseology, are obsessed with something? We saw an example of it in 2 Samuel 13 with Tamar and Amnon. The very first appearance of any form or variation of consume, okay, appears in Genesis 19. Go there, of course, Genesis 19. And you're going to see, and this I love about Scripture, a lot of the time when you're looking at a word in Scripture, a lot of the time, not all the time, the plural form of that word will appear before the singular. That that's that's very that's that happens quite often. And that does, okay? And we will be concentrating on the singular consume, okay? But the very first appearance of any variation of the word consume is the plural form consumed. Genesis 19 15 on to verse 17. And, and now the context. Pay attention to this context. This is when the two angels went down to Sodom and Gomorrah and got Lot out. Okay? Verse 15 on to verse 17. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. In the iniquity of the city. Consumed. That's the first appearance of any variation of the word consume. Look at the context of that. Look at that verse. Consumed in the iniquity of the city. So, consumed. Iniquity of the city. Okay? We use the term consumed as to eat food. Okay, yes. Yes. Okay. All right. But when we are looking in Scripture here, we're going to see that consume is also likened onto, I think, what we use as obsess. Let's continue. And while he lingered, the men laid hold on his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. Verse 17. And it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. Lest thou be consumed. Okay? Now, 
Let's go to Exodus. Now we're going to shift to the singular form. Here's the very first appearance of the singular form of consume. Exodus 32. Exodus 32. Verses 7 on to verse 14. Now, consume the iniquity of the city. Flee unless you be consumed. Okay? Question. Was not Ammon, Amnon, excuse me, consumed, burn? He had, he had a lust. He had concupiscence. He was covetous, coveting. Okay? Okay? Exodus 32, verses 7 on to verse 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Get thee down, for thy people which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I commanded them. They have made them a molten calf, and have worshipped it, and have sacrificed thereunto, and said, These be thy gods, plural, <laughs> O Israel, which have brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Okay, okay, molten calf, singular. Okay, you Trinitarian, gotta, gotta bash the Trinity every chance I get. Amen, amen. Here. Oh, your stinking, vile, vomitous trinity. Okay? Molten calf. One calf. But these be thy gods. Plural. Woo! <laughs> okay? Remember, the teaching of, of the trinity got its inception in Babylon. Crafted in Egypt. It has been perfected in Rome with one god and three persons. <laughs> Insanity. Okay? Now, let's continue. And the Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, it is a stiff-necked people. Now therefore, let me alone. Pay attention. Pay attention to this verse. Now look at this verse. Let's read this slowly. Now therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may wax hot. Hot against them, and that I may consume them, and I will make of thee a great nation. There's the very first appearance of the singular consume. Look at the context of the verse. Wrath, hot, consume. Did not Amnon have wrath after he got what he thought he wanted? Hmm? Did he not burn for his half-sister? Hmm? Did it consume him? That, that's kind of obvious, isn't it? Let's continue. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people? which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand. And what are we reading to? Verse 14. Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, For mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains, and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of the evil against thy people. Ah, there we see right there, wrath equated with consuming, to consume in this context. Okay? Remember, how a word is used scripturally is defined by context. Okay, you got to watch out for that because, uh, again, with these guys who say, like, uh, Logos or whatever it is, um, uh, Mac MacArthur is big for that, saying that every time that a certain Greek word appears in whatever Greek he uses, okay, there's a myriad of them, that it always ought to be rendered slave. No, no. Context defines the word, okay? Just so we know. But uh, there again, look at consume, how it is used, and the sandwich that is around the meat of the word consume, okay? Verse 13, 
Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. Verse 14. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Okay, Moses acting as intercessor. The Lord was going to do that, but the Lord, you know, that whole thing with Moses is for instruction and in righteousness, how we as saints. It's like, hey, you know, Lord, I, I know, don't, you know, spare these people kind of thing, okay? All right, be part of intercessor there, all right? We, we can go in another direction in that entirely, but we will not, okay? Exodus 33, now verses 1 on to verse 5. And the Lord said unto Moses, Depart and go up hence, thou and the people which thou hast brought up out of the land of Egypt, unto the land which I swear unto Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, saying unto thy seed will I give it. And I will send an angel before thee, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. For I will not go up in the midst of thee, for thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. Hmm. Consume thee. Burn them up. And when it comes to this thing of concupiscence, which we're going to look at, covetousness, okay, and also lust, all right, those were all three aspects that Amnon exhibited towards Tamar, or t towards Tamar, okay, to the point where he, in a burning, which turned into wrath, don't miss that, was consumed by it. Very fascinating. Let's continue. And I will send an angel before thee, and will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hivite, and the Jebusite, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. For I, for I will not go up in the midst of thee. For thou art a stiff-necked people, lest I consume thee in the way. And when the people heard these evil tidings, they mourned, and no man put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said unto Moses, Say unto the children of Israel, Ye are a stiff-necked people. I will come up into the midst of thee in a moment, and consume thee. Okay? Therefore now put off thy ornaments from thee, that I may know what to do unto thee. So we see how consume is being used with heat, wrath, hot, anger. Ammon and Tamar. This love, which was a lust, which, which involved covetousness, which involved lust and concupiscence, okay? But he was consumed. It burned him. And then after he got what he thought he wanted, wrath. Mm. Psalm 37. Psalm 37. Psalm 37. I'm not being dogmatic about this, by the way. I'm sharing this with you as, you know, just something to chew on. Okay? Words are important. Words do have meaning. And again, obsess. Obsession is not found in Scripture. Is this your perfect standard or what? You know, you can liken this onto fast. Fast is in Scripture, but fast the way God intended had nothing to do with speed. Okay? Worry! Worry is not found in Scripture. Okay? Fret is. Fret. Okay? Um, tired is in Scripture. But as we see with tired, has nothing to do with lack of rest. Okay? All right? Those videos will be in the description box as well. Okay? See, the point is, we have a perfect standard. And with a perfect standard, this is where you base things off of. 
not philosophy and vain deceit, which are enemies who obsess, besiege the saints. Do. Very interesting. Okay. Psalm 37, 18 on to 20. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. Now pay attention to this context. And in the days of famine, they shall be satisfied. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke. Shall they consume away. Ah. Twice in that one verse. Look at the context here. We see famine in verse 19. Famine. Okay? They shall not be ashamed in the evil time. Who will not be ashamed? Of saints. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright, and their inheritance shall be forever. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Okay? When I'm, I'm predestinated to be with the Lord Jesus Christ because He has sealed me and dwells within me. Okay? That's what that means. Not this stupid Calvinistic stuff. Okay? Verse 20 again. But the wicked shall perish. And the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. They shall consume into smoke, shall they consume away. Again, we see the use, the use of this burning. But we also see in the context, famine. Famine. Because what does it say in 18? The days of the upright. The Lord knoweth the days of the upright. Okay. Interesting. Psalm 39, Psalm 39, verses 7 on to verse 13, to the close. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in Thee. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish, someone who behaves as if he says in his heart, there is no God. I was dumb. I opened not my mouth, because thou didst it. Dumb doesn't mean lack of intelligence. Dumb means not being able to speak. <laughs> Look at the verse, okay? Remove thy stroke away from me. I am consumed by the blow of thine hand. Ah. Ah. See, when a saint departs from the Lord, and it happens, the Lord can send, oh, so many things, you know. Like with uh, when Peter saw the wind boisterous, he took his eyes off of Jesus because he was concentrating on the wind. He who observeth the wind shall not sow. He who regardeth the clouds will not reap. I might have the sow and reap a little backwards there, but the point is, Okay, when you depart from the Lord, okay, Jonah, God said to Jonah, go do this, you know, Jonah, we all have free will, exercise his free will, it's like, I ain't doing that, but see, the Lord wanted him to do that, and he wasn't going to force Jonah to do that either, so what did he do, he sent the tempest, and then the dudes were like, what, what, why is this happening, it's, oh, it's your fault? And then they wanted to row the boat back, but Jonah's like, dude, just throw me in the ocean. And they're like, we don't want to do that, but it got so bad, it's like, fine, whoop, whoop, there you go, okay? See, when a saint departs from the Lord, he's going to send a storm after you. But see, we have free will. You can, and remember this, dear saints, You can continue on to the point where the Lord will be like, okay then. You you want your little Tamar, don't you? You want your you want your Tamar, don't you? Don't you? Fine, go ahead. 
to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You better be very careful. You better be very careful for what you think you want, dear saint. Let's continue. All right. Verse 11. When thou with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity, I should have just let the scriptures define that. I beg your pardon. Thou makest his beauty to consume away like a moth. Surely every man is vanity. Selah. Again, Emma and Tamar. He was so vexed with his sister. Thought she was so beautiful, obviously. Obviously, okay? But what happened? He got what he thought he wanted in a forceful manner? That consuming, that burning, turned to wrath, turned to hate. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear unto my cry. Hold not thy peace at my tears. For I am a stranger with thee, and a sojourner, as all my fathers were. Oh, spare me, that I may recover strength before I go hence and be no more. Psalm 49, verses 6 on to verse 15. <laughs> like this. They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. Yes, because the blood of Jesus Christ is precious, because he never sinned. Okay? For the redemption of their soul, verse 8, is precious, and it ceaseth forever, that he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he seeth that wise men die, Likewise, the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. There's one event unto all. We're all going to die. We're all going to die. Okay? Then why was, I so, why was I even then more wise? Right? Now pay attention. Their inward thought is that their houses shall continue forever. And their dwelling places to all generations. They call their lands after their own names. Nevertheless, man being in honor abideth not. He is like the beasts that perish. Natural brute beasts who perish because they're not saved. Hmm, interesting. This their way is their folly. Yet their posterity approve their sayings. Well, look at me. Look at my life. Think about the antinomianist pond scum. It's like, look at how happy I am. I'm not concerned with sin because I just saved myself by my own belief. Therefore, I can engage in anything I want and don't even worry about it. Fools make a mock at sin. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 14. Like sheep. Pay attention. Like sheep they are laid in the grave. Death shall feed on them. Death. Dying. Are you consumed with dying? And the wages of sin is death. Oh. Mmm. Mmm. And Coincidentally, what happened to Amnon? Amnon, excuse me. Oh, he got he done got killed by Absalom, didn't he? The wages of sin is death. Let's continue. Like sheep they are laid in the grave, death shall feed on them. And the upright shall have dominion over them in the morning. And their beauty shall consume in the grave from their dwelling consume be eaten up in the grave hmm. you know sin is made to look enticing beautiful but when you have it it eats you up 
can consume you. Are you getting this so far? I know you are, Saint. I know you are, Saint. Verse 15. But God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Sila. Ah. Psalm 59. Uh, notice the nines thus far. Psalm 39, Psalm 49, Psalm 59. There are a lot of other appearances that we could look at, but Psalm 59, 5 on the 13. <laughs> Obsessed, as in Webster's 1828 dictionary. Obsession, besieging, modern dictionary. Uh, someone who that can consume with the individual at the behest of the Vatican. Okay? Thou therefore, O Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to visit all the heathen. Be not merciful to any wicked transgressors. Selah. They return at even, evening. They make a noise like a dog. <laughs> and go round about the city. Behold, they belch out with their mouth. Swords are in their lips. For who, say they, doth hear? But thou, O Lord, shalt laugh at them. Thou shalt have all the heathen in derision. All you heretics out there who preach this other Jesus, another gospel, the one who you're mocking is going to mock you and laugh at you eventually. <laughs> Just believe in, receive there, sweetie pie. <laughs> because of his strength will I wait upon thee, for God is my defense. The God of my mercy shall prevent me. God shall let me see my desire upon mine enemies. Now think about that. Prevent me. The God of my mercy. I, again, I praise the Lord. That he withheld from me the things that I would let consume me. Praise the Lord that the Lord doesn't give us everything that we think we want. Praise the Lord. He knows better. Slay them not. Let Lest my people forget. You know, uh, some saints who are in grotesque sin, well, why doesn't the Lord keep them home? Or take them home? Well, God, God works through example, doesn't he? You can read, you know, all things that were written uh, before time were written for our learning. Okay, these were done for an example or an ensample. I love that word. So that we might not do as they did. Okay, God uses example. So, when you got a saint who is totally messed up, but yet God hasn't taken him home or killed him yet. Why? Well, to put into the equation, slay them not lest my people forget. Scatter them by thy power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. God forbid, if you are a saint and the Lord is using you as an example unto other saints on how not to get messed up. Oh, man, I just, I just sent a shift down my spine thinking about that. Think about that, brethren. Are you involved in something and the Lord has, is, isn't even giving you anything? Number one, you need to consider what, number one, are you actually a saint? Are you actually a saint? Okay? Okay, let's say, okay, let's say you are a saint. Okay, number one. Let's say you are a saint, and you are totally messed up, and you, you know, brethren aren't saying, dude, what are you doing? Or the Lord himself or is not uh, doing anything, but just allowing you to go on? And you're a saint? Dude, you're looking at me. 
That ought to scare the living hell out of you. That ought to scare the living hell out of you. Not only am I saying, but I'm saying. Okay? Let's continue. For the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be taken in their pride, and for cursing and lying which they speak. Like the antinomianists. Bold-faced lying. Okay? Then again, most of these sweetie pies don't show their face anyway. Okay? Crazy. Crazy. Okay? Consume them in wrath. Consume them that they may not be. And let them know that God ruleth in Jacob unto the ends of the earth. Selah. So again, we see consume equated with wrath. What do we see so far? We see wrath. We see anger. We see wrath. Heat. Okay. We also saw a reference on the famine. Okay. All right. About consume. And when one is consumed with another or with something, there's a burning and there could be wrath. Okay? All right? Now, let's go to Galatians 5. Galatians 5. Galatians chapter 5. Check this out. Galatians 5, verses 13 on to verse 18. For brethren, ye have been called on to liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Remember this. For all the laws fulfilled in one word, even this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, <laughs> and as uh, as myself and Brother Alexander B. Hartley also, our uh, you know muddled streams run together. Um, you you don't want me to love you like I love myself. <laughs> God forbid. Oh, <laughs> God forbid. <laughs> You know? Anyway, let's continue. Sorry. Okay. Pay attention to this. But if ye bite, bite, and devour, heat, flame, wrath can devour. Okay? Passion. Oh! Sure did devour Amnon, didn't it? Look at these guys who obsess, besiege, consumed, aren't they? You know, I guess sometimes we should feel honored, huh? These guys got nothing better to do. They're at the behest of the Vatican anyway. But let's continue. But if ye bite and devour one another, okay, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. So there, look at the verse. You see biting and devouring. Okay? Okay, you see that? This I say then. Walk in the capital S spirit. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Say, so we got to stop sinning. You can't. Not even Paul, the greatest of the of the the greatest of the saints of the Church of the Living God. Was he the greatest apostle? Oh, uh, the the high apostle is our Lord Jesus Christ. So anyway, 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 that's a rabbit trail that one of you can go off of. But um, not even Paul could walk in the capital S spirit in the Lord twenty four hours a day, seven days a week. This always gets in the way. Okay, no one can walk sinlessly today. Especially while you're in the flesh, okay? Meaning your spirit and soul are housed in this sagging sin suit, okay? For the flesh lusteth 
against the spirit, capital S, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things ye would. Hmm. Verse 18. Now, the gods of lasciviousness, you know, these stupid, vile, disgusting, vomitous, rank, antinomianists uh, will come to a verse like this. You know, they, they are bound by no law, <laughs> okay? They, they, you know, they just freely go on with nothing to uh, hinder them. They're all about, you know, a license to sin. That will be in the description box for you, okay? But if ye be led of the capitalist spirit, ye are not under the law. Like I said, the video about this will be in the description box. You don't want to really watch that or at least listen to it? That's your problem, okay? All right? So now it comes to this thing about consuming, okay? Consuming. But now let's take a second, put that away. For, for right now. Now, we saw Scripture consume. Scripture first. Let's see what Mr. Our beloved Mr. Noah says about consume. Okay? Consume. In Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Consume. To destroy. Hmm. What happens when someone gets to this thing where um, you can obsess about it? Where you can obsess, besiege, right? And remember, obsess is not in the scripture, okay? To destroy by separating the parts of a thing. To, by decomposition, as by fire or by eating, devouring, and annihilating the form of a substance. Fire consumes wood, coal, stubble. Animals consume flesh and vegetables. And when you have a burning like Ammon did, where all you could do is think of this, you know, being having relations with his half sister, okay? And that's all that he was about with that, okay? To destroy by dissipating or by use, to expend, to waste. To squander as to consume an estate. Ye ask and receive not. because ye, And we're going to read this too. Because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your lusts. We're going to, we're going to read that today. Okay. And that's from James, by the way. We're going to read that, so don't worry about it. To spend. Look at what Amnon did. In order, he, he faked that he was sick. Okay? To spend, to cause to pass away as time, as to consume the day in idleness. Idleness. <laughs> Very appropriate. Very appropriate. Okay? Their days did he consume in vanity. To cause to disappear, to waste slowly, my flesh is consumed away. Job. Hmm. To destroy, to bring to utter ruin, to exterminate. Let me alone that I may consume them, which we already looked at. Okay? And when you put this in con context of someone being consumed, burning, destroying, wasting away, spending, you know, being consumed with another individual or something like that. Hmm. To cause to, okay, to destroy, to bring to utter ruin, to exterminate, okay, consume again. Verb intransitive, I think that means, to waste away slowly, to be exhausted. Uh, these guys who are consumed with the body of Christ, okay, it burns them up. All they do is think about them, okay, they besiege them, okay, all right. Uh, let me see. To waste away slowly, to be exhausted. Their flesh, their eyes, their tongue shall consume away. Zechariah. The wicked shall perish. They shall consume. Consumed. Wasted. 
burnt up, destroyed, dissipated, squandered, expended. Okay? So the main thing that we're seeing, especially in Scripture, when it comes to consume, the main thing that we're seeing is a burning and wrath. But burning, burning. Question. Was not Amnon burning? Hmm? When you're um, being allowing something to consume you, like being consumed with, say, a, a person, spiritual body, or with a thought, or with an idea, okay? Doesn't it burn? Like, you know, I could be, I, for example, you know, my heart is on fire for the Lord. My heart is burning because I'm consumed with His Word. Burning, burning. I want to, I'm, you know, you know, that's one way you could put it, I suppose. Okay? But now, now, I'd like us to see in the modern dictionary, consume. Hold on one second. Consume in the modern, in a more modern dictionary. To destroy us by fire, do away with, to use up, to spend wastefully, squander time, energy, money, to eat or drink up, devour, to absorb completely. And we see that example also in Scripture where the Lord will, I will consume them. Okay? To consume completely, engross or obsess, this one uses. And going off of what Webster says, besieging. Hmm, very interesting. Um, I can't even see it. Consumed with envy. A consuming interest. To buy for one's personal needs. Uh, now rare, to waste away, perish. To buy consumer goods or services for one's personal needs. Okay? And then consume. Extremely or excessively. And that's from the modern one. And I, you know, I rarely use this. And uh, Now, this is a moment where they both kind of said the same thing. But when it came to obsess, hmm, I wonder why that is. Now, let's shift a little. Lust. Lust. Very first appearance of the word lust. Okay, well, we're just going to look at this one appearance. In Exodus chapter 15, verses 6 on to verse 11. Okay, and pay attention to this context. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thy excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumed them as stubble. Okay? And with the blast of thy nostrils, the water where the waters were gathered together, the flood stood up as in heap, and the depths were congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil, my lust shall be satisfied upon them, I will draw with the sword, my hand shall destroy them. There's first appearance of lust in any type of form in the scripture. Look at the context. The enemy said, I will pursue, besiege, I will overtake, being consumed as with fire, I will divide the spoil, my lust shall be satisfied on, upon them, I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind, the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. 
Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful to pre to, in praise, doing wonders? Look at verse 9 again. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. Today's the 26th, isn't it? And with the enemies of our Lord, they, you know, these devils who besiege the body of Christ, who themselves are consumed. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be like unto him. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Hmm. But, verses 13 on to verse 16 in Proverbs 26. With these devils who the slothful man saith there is a lion in the way. A lion is in the streets. As the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. These guys have nothing better to do than to hound, to be consumed by what the saints do and besiege them endlessly mm. with video upon video upon video upon video. Okay. <laughs> okay. Too much time on your hands. Idleness. And an idle soul shall suffer hunger. <laughs> Yes, as the door turneth upon his hinges, so doth the slothful upon his bed. The slothful hideth his hand in his bosom, the hidden hand. It grieveth him to bring it again to his mouth. The sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than seven men that can render a reason. Amnon had apparently a whole bunch of time to be consumed with the thought of his sister, his half-sister Tamar. And she gave reason, logic to him, which he didn't take. Very interesting. Now, verses 17 to verse 26. And when you have all this time on your hands, when, you're, and when you work at the behest of the Vatican, okay, what do, and what do they do? What do they do? He that passeth by and meddleth with stripe belonging not to him is like one that taketh a dog by the ears. They get themselves involved. Hmm. They interject themselves with their little attack pieces and whatnot. Okay? They would take a dog by the ears that... Arr! Okay? As a madman, someone crazy like the devils are, who casteth firebrands, arrows, and death. Hey, don't worry about sin. The wages of sin is death. Don't worry about it. You just believe and receive. Don't you shouldn't do that. But don't worry if you do. Don't worry. It ain't going to affect your salvation. Yeah, a salvation that is not yours. It's the Lord's. But see, when you save yourself by your own belief, it is your salvation. Anyway, anyway. So is the man that deceiveth his neighbor, and saith, And not I in sport. Hmm. Where no wood is, there the fire goeth out. So where there is no tail bearer, the strife ceaseth. And these guys, devils, are like that. They start fires. They are tail bearers. They lie bold facedly. I think that's why some of them don't ha -ha show their faces. Okay? I, I think so. All right, I, I really do because the, I mean, especially with like little sweetheart up there, there is a working knowledge of truth for them to deceive so obviously, and the conditioning of a man is in his eyes. I, you know, like uh, with that one universalist idiot who's not an idiot. I, I'm using that to offend. Okay, I am. All right. Um, he, he did a lot of this. The hunter from England does a lot of this too. 
when when talking on a video. Now, you got to remember, people can be trained to maintain eye contact. Okay, that is possible, yes. But, even though, even so, it's in the eyes. Which is why I think a lot of these devils don't show their face. Because if you were to take a look at them, if you were to, I mean, face to face, you look with some of these guys in their eyes, oh, you can see the deadness. Hmm. Fascinating. Fascinating. Okay, anyway, let's continue. As coals are to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. These guys are contentious. These devils are all contentious. They kindle strife. Look at what they do. I rest my case. The words of a talebearer are as wounds, and they go down into the innermost parts of the belly. And their God is their belly. Don't miss that tie in there. Like Esau, who God hated, because his God was his belly. Flesh was his God. Yeah. Burning lips and a wicked heart are like a pot shared covered with silver dross. And oh, these guys are smooth. Smooth talk. Yes. He that hateth dissembleth with his lips and layeth up deceit within him. <laughs> I don't hate you. I despise you. I don't hate you. <laughs> when he speaketh fair, Believe him not. For there are seven abominations in his heart whose hatred is covered by deceit. His wickedness shall be shewed before the whole congregation whose hatred is covered by deceit. God loves you. God loves the Christ-rejecting sinner unconditionally. Just believe and receive. Hatred covered by deceit. God does not present tense love the Christ rejecting sinner. Okay? You have to be broken of your self righteousness, which no antinomianist has ever experienced because they're lost. With the exception of a novice. That's the only exception. Every single one of you antinomianists are lost. <laughs> what God do you believe in? Yourself? The third, uh, this, the number two God and the three person trinity? Give me a break, you vile devil. Okay? Uh, antinomianist, free gracer. Okay? Oh, I will bash you guys all, all the time I can. Okay? Because you guys are the most dangerous of today. I found that very interesting about lust. Now, covet. Covetous. Okay? To covet. Exodus 18. Exodus 18. Verses 19 on to verse 22. The same thing. We're going to see covetousness before covet. Okay? Exodus 18, verses 19 on to verse 22. Okay? Ammon and Tamar, what we're working off of. Okay? He was consumed. He burned. He had wrath. It engulfed him. It inflamed him. It consumed him. He had lust. His hatred was covered with deceit. Okay? He thought he had love. It was lust. Okay? Covet. Covet. Hearken now unto me, unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to God word. And this is uh, Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, speaking unto Moses. Okay? Read the context on your own time. Okay? Be thou for the people to God word, that thou mayest bring the causes unto God. 
And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and shalt shew them the way wherein they must walk, and the work that thou must do. Moreover, thou shalt provide out of all the people able men, such as fear, such as fear God, men of truth, hating covetousness. Hmm. And place such over them to be rulers of thousands and rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties and rulers of tens. And you can make the tie in in uh, First Timothy about the qualifications of a bishop. Number one, a bishop is to be a man, not a woman of man. But see, see, you get a Bible that puts man's words in place of God's words, okay, then you can justify anything, okay? But you can make the comparison there with Exodus 18, 21, with, with the qualifications of a bishop. He must be a man, you know, not given to wine, not covetous, okay, not greedy of filthy lucre, that kind of thing. You can make that tie in. Didn't make it for this video, but you can do that on your own time. Verse 22. Let them judge the people at all seasons. Oh, but that's Old Testament. We're not supposed to judge today. <laughs> With the exception of a novice, and that's very thin, uh, you people say, oh, judge me. Are we talking about you eating, uh, being a vegetarian and me being a, uh, a meatarian? No. No, you're saying that to protect sin. The Lord rebuke you. Okay? And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, but every small matter they shall judge. So shall it be easier for thyself, and they shall bear the burden with thee. Okay? First thing of covetousness, of covet in any variation, is right there. And it's covetousness. Now, first appearance of covet... Which, which is in the next chapter, okay? Which is in the next chapter. In the Ten Commandments, the Tenth Commandment. Not the Ninth and the Tenth, okay? Rome removes a commandment so they can have their little, you know, little pagan statues and stuff like that. But Exodus 20, verse 17, here's the very first appearance of the word covet in the singular form. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Now you could say, well, Amnon was coveting. Yes, he was. Yes, he was. Absolutely. Not denying that at all. Not denying that at all. But there was also lust involved, wasn't there? Come on. Come on. So see, all these aspects working into that being consumed. Okay? Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. And be content with such things as you have. And I remember what that devil, George Carlin, once said. You know, thou shalt not covet. He, you know, mocking the Ten Commandments that he did. You know, he's like, leave covetousness alone. That creates jobs. That's what George Carlin actually said. Covetous. Now, we're going to keep this. We're going we're gonna to be diverted a little bit. But we're going to get back to this thing about covetous. Because there are devils out there who get cute who get cute. Well, Paul tells us to covet. We're going to address that. We are going to address that. Now, the covet here that we see, and covetousness, which we first saw, and covet. What is the object? What is the point of the covet? Well, his manservant, his wife, his stuff, but What's the main object? Idolatry. The idol 
is the reflection of the true idol, yourself. So, when someone is exhibiting this type of covetous, this covet, it's what at the center? Amnon! His covet was what? I, 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 me, 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 me. Ye shall be as God, gods. Okay, ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. Okay, save yourself by your own belief. Just believe and receive. What's the focal point? You. Don't worry. We're we going to touch on that. We're we going to touch on that. But Psalm 10. Psalm 10. Don't get ahead of me. We're, we're gonna, oh, don't worry. We're going we're gonna to annihilate that. We're going to annihilate that. Because see, some of you guys, and that's what these devils do. You know, they, they twist things and they, 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 they strain at a gnat and swallow the camel. Okay? Uh, it's, they get cute. So well, Paul tells, tells us to covet. Psalm 10, verses 1 on verse 4. Why standest thou afar off, O Lord? Why hidest thou thyself in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride doth persecute the poor. Let them be taken in the devices that they have imagined. The wicked boasteth, boasteth of his heart's desire and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, countenance the body, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. When you get that lust going there, buddy, when you get that concupiscence, that, that um, covetousness that consumes you, Hmm. Where's God in all your thoughts? You better think about this, man. You really need to you really need to consider these things. Cuz if you're a saint and you've been given over to your you know, being consumed with your lust, your covetousness, and your concupiscence. And you're a saint, and you're not getting any rebukes, or the rebukes that you are hearing, you're not taking to heart, but going on still in your trespass and sin. If you're a saint, now I scare the hell out of you. You have not gone past the point where you cannot return. Or have you? There's only three that know that. God who is our Father, you, and the devil. Yeah, we're, uh, we're, uh, yeah. The wicked through the pride of his countenance will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Let's read verse 5. His ways are always grievous. Thy judgments are far above out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he puffeth at them. And who is the enemy to someone who is consumed? You know, dude, you, you, you shouldn't be doing that. Dude, don't judge me. Don't judge me. All things are lawful for me. Amen, brother, to your comment in the pre, uh, previous video. Okay? Romans 7. Romans 7. Okay? Romans 7. Verses 7 on verse 9. Okay? Hinge this because we are going to touch on this, but we, we have an order that we are going through with this. Okay? Romans 7, verses 7 on verse 9. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay. I had not known sin, 
but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. Concupiscence. Okay? Concupiscence, we're going to look at it, is mentioned three times in Scripture. Concupiscence is not good. Some to defend sin would say, well, there's a good concupiscence and there is an evil concupiscence because it says evil, evil concupiscence. Yes, it does. But <laughs> um, context, dear friend. Context, dear friend. Oh, that, that uh, Shepherd's Chapel uh, video that we did, uh, Shepherd's, yeah, uh, where we talk about context, okay? That'll be in the description. Uh, a lot of videos for the description box, too. Anyway, verse 9, uh, verse 8. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, because now you know what sin is, because it said not to covet, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. I knew what I was doing was wrong. Uh, Romans 13, 1 verse, verse 9. For this thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. If you don't have the authorized version of the scriptures, this is probably not in there. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying. Namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Covet. Concupiscence now. Now, the one uh, appearance of concupiscence we just saw in Romans chapter 7. In verse 8. Concupiscence. Colossians 3. Colossians 3. Okay? Colossians 3. Verses 1 on to verse 7. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. But what does Christianity do? Makes you, you know, well, you got to be like the world, win the world. <laughs> Never mind. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, they sh then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, kill, therefore, your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. And see right there. They say, well, there's a good concupiscence and there's an evil. And they come to this. It's like, okay, the very first appearance of concupiscence, which we saw in Romans chapter 7, in context, verses 7 on verse 9, was not good. See, again, brethren, this is the level, this is the type of mind that will search for anything to justify sin. Like the antinomianists do. That's why these guys are scripturally inept. Okay? A saint, sooner or later, will give up. A saint will be, will, a saint can get involved, horrifically involved in sin. Yes, they can. But a saint, eventually, will stop making excuses. A saint will eventually do that. It's like, you know, what, who else am I to go to? What else am I to say? I've sinned. Where the false convert will keep the thing going in a circle, never ending, never ending, trying to find loophole after loophole, kind of like the round bale sun cookie. Round, around and round and round they go. I've been saved for 16 years. Every saint that I have ever encountered, sooner or later, give up. It's like, what, 
how are you? How am I going to argue with God? How am I going to justify myself before God? You know, I'm in sin. What am I going to do? I can't. I, I, I. Whereas the false, keep it going, keep it going, keep it going. And covetousness, which is idolatry. Idolatry, and you look at all that. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, concupiscence, excuse me, and covetousness, which is idolatry. They don't have a pronunciation key for that word, by the way. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience, which in the which ye also walked some time when ye lived in them. Past tense meaning that now you're a saint. Hmm. Very, very interesting. First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 3 on to verse 8. And see, this right here spits in the, uh, uh, in the face of the antinomianists who, you know, number one, they're scripturally inept. But when they go to scripture, it's always to justify themselves. And they keep that going and going and going and going. Okay? And they'll do anything they can to justify their sin. Because an antinomianist is, all it is is a license to sin. That's all it is. Okay? You're the liar there, sweetheart. <laughs> oh. Uh, where, where is we? Uh, verses 3 on verse 8. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that ye should abstain from fornication. That every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. But yeah, when you're cussing and making innuendos and speaking like the world in your live streams, okay? Yeah. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God, that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, and we also have for as we also have forewarned you and testified, whose hatred is hidden by deceit. Hmm. Those are the three appearances of concupiscence. Now you could go to Webster and say, well, not all concupiscence is bad. What's your standard, brother? What's your standard? The use of concupiscence that we have seen in Scripture. Any good. <laughs> Let's continue. Verse 7. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. Unless you're an antinomianist, then hey, you could be as filthy and vile as you want because hey, the more you sin, the more God's grace is abounding. And hey, because you're under grace, there is no law. You're lawless. Again, we, we prove that of these disgusting free gracers in the, uh, uh, the one video, uh, uh, The Gods of Lasciviousness, okay? All right? He therefore that despiseth despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his holy capital S spirit. And the Lord is that spirit. See, you, you free graces, you ain't saved. You're devils. And see, someone who has the Lord within them, he that, therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God. You know, when the children of Israel said, we will have a king to rule us, rule over us like everyone else. Okay? Samuel went to the Lord. It's like, Lord! And the Lord's like, don't worry. Okay? Do as they said. They haven't rejected you. They have rejected me. You remember that, Saint. When you're in a situation and something comes up and the Lord's like, you go warn these people. And they, you know, they, they attack the messenger. Okay? They can't attack God. 
but they can attack us. And we're not gods. Okay? All right? They did unspeakable things to Paul. What were they trying to get out of him? The Lord. And see, a saint, they can flay us, beat us, harass us, besiege us, but they're not getting rid of the Lord in us. And that's one of the things that consumes these people. Okay? Now, now, we have seen that covet is not a good thing. But see, again, some of you people will get cute. Now let's go back to Romans chapter 7. Okay, let's see this again. Okay, Paul says in Romans chapter 7, I've run into this before. I have mano y mano even run into this before. Romans 7, verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. So, coveting is bad, right? But some of these guys get cute. They get, they get really cute. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verses 22 on to verse 31. Now, remember... The examples of covet that we have already looked at, what is the focal point of the covetousness? That, and we, you know, James is the, which we will end this video on. But we got we to gotta go through this process, okay? The covetousness of Christianity is you. You are your be-all, be end-all. You are your own standard. The world revolves around you about how you feel, how you can justify. I, 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 me, 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 me. I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. Isaiah 14, 12 under 15. Ye shall be like the Most High. I will be like the Most High. Okay? That's what Christianity has as its focus. Antinomianism, Catholicism, organized Christianity in its entirety, even King James Bible believing Christianity. Why? Because you belong to a part of a group. It's all about you. I'm a King James Bible believing Christian. You're affixed to something. See, it's all about you. It's all about you. But then you come to 1 Corinthians 12, 22 and 31. Nay, much more, th those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, that our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked that there should be no schism in the body. See, that schism is a scriptural word. But that the members should have the same care one for another. When you have a brother or a sister, dude, it's like, Brad, let, let's talk about something in scripture. That hurts. But see, that's true love. Not this love that Christianity offers you. Okay? And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. Or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who, who rejoice. Okay? Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God has set some in the church. What are we reading to? Verse 31, to the close. In the church, the body, not a building. First apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? Have all the gifts of healings? Do all speak with tongues? Languages. Do all interpret? 
But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet I shew unto you a more excellent way. And then it goes into the chapter that talks about charity, which is self-sacrifice. Well, Paul said to covet. To what end, though? See, the covet that Christianity, antinomianism, Catholicism with antinomianism is just another daughter of the whore, Roman Catholicism. Okay? But Christianity, they are they say about covet, you know, because you are the focal point. It's all about you. Like in Proverbs 7, you know, I came to meet thee, and I, you know, because of thee, you know, love bombing. This love. <laughs> yeah. But see, but covet earnestly the best gifts. See, Pentecostals with their blah, 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 blah. Well, that, that's a special gift for special people in the body of Christ. Or, uh, not all of us have seen the Lord. None of us have seen the Lord. Okay? All right? See, covetousness in Christianity exalts you. When Paul, right there, says to covet the best gifts, not that we may be exalted, but that the gifts that we have been given may be given to others. It's like when the Lord gives you a gem, my dear beloved. You got to share those things. Not keep them to yourself. See, the gifts that God gives unto the saints is meant to, to be given unto others when Christianity hoards it all for themselves. That's the difference. Okay? Okay? Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4. Verses 9 on to verse 16. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Why? So that I can, well, I, I've led so many people to Christ. Or, or I, I speak in tongues more than you all. Or, or I, you know, look at me, my ministry. I, 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 me, me, me. No, 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 no. For the perfecting of the saints. For the work of the ministry. For the edifying of the body of Christ. You're, you are not your own. And the gifts that the Lord has given you. Brother. Sister. Are not to be hoarded. For yourself. So that you can boast of yourself. Like a lot of these guys do. These YouTube preachers. You know, the gifts that God gives us are intended to be shared on, with others, given on to others. See, that's why 1 Corinthians so, uh, 13 with charity is so important. You mess it up, you destroy what God said when you, in 1 Corinthians 13, put love in place of charity because charity is self-sacrifice and charity and liberty are two different things. Anyway, let's continue. Till we all come in the unity of the faith and, the, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We covered this in the one video, um, Can't We All Get Along, okay? That we henceforth be no more children. What are we reading to? 16. Children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive, to besiege, <laughs> to besiege. They, they rest not unless they cause some to fall. Consumed, burned, obsessed, which does not appear in Scripture, but to besiege. Hmm. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things 
which is the head, even Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, which increase maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. I've on saints have, you know, come down kind of harshly before. It's like, well, brother, I, I, I you know, uh, you know, a saint who has has been given, you know, something, a gift, and I, I know they're not, you know, you know, it's like, dude, share that. Well, I, I can't, bro. dude, shut up. Were you, were you gonna be a hoarder, huh? Huh? You think that? You think that's just for you, huh? Share it. Give it away. It's not about you. Okay? Okay? Philippians 2, verses 3 and 8. Fulfill, uh, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory. Uh, my ministry. Yes, Paul used the phrase, my ministry. See, see, see you, you go to that to defend yourself. Paul did it under duress. You're doing it to exalt yourself. Big difference. Let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each other, let each, eat, let each esteem other better than themselves. Like I said, every saint that I know is better than I am. I believe that because it's the truth. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Charity, self-sacrifice. Let this mind be in you, which also, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And you check the Bible, those that verse is totally messed up. But made himself of no reputation. And took upon him the form of a servant. This is the mind of Christ. Servant. And was made in the likeness of men. What are we reading to? Verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And you can go ahead and read on your own time. John 13. John 13. We have the mind of Christ. Then why do you keep sinning? Why do you think wicked thoughts? That's something stupid that the, the doubly do right dude would come up with. Okay? No. No. The mind of Christ is the mind of a servant. John 13, 1 on the 10. Our dear brother Alexander B. Hartley gave a very good perspective on this, which I believe I copied and put into the um, community section on the channel here. I don't recall, um, brother, if you're watching, and you, you will see this. Uh, you have to refresh my memory, but anyway. Now, before the Feast of Passover, we're reading on verse 10, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, Passover supper, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Shimon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garment. This is God the Father. And took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. God, the creator of the heaven and the earth. God, the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. 
the lamb without spot or without wrinkle. Put aside his garments, took a towel, and washed the thing. Have you ever worn, we've talked about this before. Now, during this time, they most likely were wearing sandals, open-toed shoes, especially in the climate of the Middle East, okay? Um, we're, we're not going to get on the thing of whether or not they had closed-toed shoes. Yes, there were, but a majority of these guys were most likely wearing sandals, okay? Open-toed shoes, okay? And, if you've, and what they were made of were not made of the materials that we have today synthetics say you know but like have you ever worn leather sandals for eight hours in a hot day and gotten sand in them whoa okay all right the you know in wearing sandals you think well it's open toed air can get there uh, as opposed to closed toed but yeah yeah that can be very nasty and rank and raunchy it really can okay the point is God the Father washed the disciples rotten, nasty, stinking, dirty feet. You talk about charity. That's the mind of Christ right there, a servant who had every right to have that done to him. He didn't need it, of course, but the point is he came to serve, not to be served. Then cometh he to Shimon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, wilt thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter, big mouth, okay? Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part of with me. Never wash my feet, I'll climb up some other way. Remember, Peter, was, Peter wasn't saved yet. Okay. Shimon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Thy eyes offend thee, pluck it out. Thy hand offend thee, cut it off. Thy foot offend thee, cut it off. Mm. Don't, don't miss that. Jesus saith to him, He that is washed need not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, and not all. Verse 11, For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. Talking about um, Judas Iscariot. Um, and let's look at verse 15. Remember I mentioned about how God uses things, you know, for example. Verse 15, For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verse 14 and 15. If I then your Lord and Master have washed your feet, ye, all, ye, also, ye also ought to wash one another's feet, brethren's feet. That's the mind of Christ. So, now go to 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. Verses 30 on to verse 40. We're almost done. Verse 33 on to verse 40. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? Now, there are circumstances, yes, we're not going to get into that, if you want, you can watch the uh, 
videos, a woman of God, okay, like that. Remember, what Mr. Dudley Do-Right Dude, the um, holiness imitator, emulator, uh, did a video about that. Um, he justified sin. He was justifying um, his lovely helpmeet teaching men as well. Okay, watch out for that devil. Okay, watch out for that. He did not intuit the fact that you put a woman on a platform such as YouTube. Guess what? There are men watching as well. Okay? Just just to make you aware of that. Watch out for that guy. Just because he's in your little King James Bible believing group does not mean he's a saint. Okay? Watch out. Okay? Watch out. What? Came the word of God out from you only? From you? Or came it onto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of God. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy. You see it again. And forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. So you see Paul again saying, covet but for what end to bolster yourself to justify yourself to exalt yourself no that you may help others you have nothing to do we just looked at john 13 dude okay the gifts that we have are meant to give on others so when Paul says to covet those, it's not for, look at me, look at me, look at my ministry, look at what I do. It's not that. It's so that can be given unto others, so others may be edified. Okay? See, the focal point is different. Christianity, you are the focal point. You, 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 you. It's all about how you feel, about how you can justify sin. It's about you and your best life now. That's Christianity. Or it's about you belonging onto your little cultish clique. But when Paul uses it, it's in context to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. What the Lord has put in himself, work out and share with others. I have known of saints who because of their petty fear I okay I don't fret men okay uh, I'm not going to fear men okay but I understand why some saints have that I understand it that doesn't make it okay if you've been given a gift you go as the Lord will guide you obviously obviously but if you've been given a gift and you know that the Lord has like hey Hey, come on. I, I, I do something with that that I gave you, okay? I've given that to you to give on to others. And you sit on your hands. That's dangerous, brother, sister. That's dangerous. Ultimately, 1 John 5, 1 John 5, verses 10 on to verse 15. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record, the scriptures, that God gave of his Son. When I say, when the scriptures say, Son of God, God manifest in the flesh. When a Trinitarian says, Son of God, they're making reference onto a person who is one of three that make one God. Two different things. Son of man. Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. Son of God. God manifest in the flesh. Son of David. King of kings, Lord of lords. King of the Jews. Okay? So, you hear a Trinitarian talking about Son of God. They're a Trinitarian. That's not the true God. That's not the real God. 
Okay, that's satanic. Okay? Because Trinitarians are like, well, I believe in the Son of God. Uh, you believe in a three-person trinity, and that's the one in the middle to you. Not one God who is comprised of spirit, soul, and body. Amen, brother, to your comments. Amen. Don't delete those. Don't do that. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. See, the Trinitarian deceives you with the three-person thing. See, God is one God comprised of spirit, soul, and body. Okay, 1 John 5, 7 proves that. That's not about the Trinity. That's one God. Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Okay, in him, all fullness dwells, okay? Okay, one God. We're made in the image of God. We have a spirit, we have a soul, we have a body. Quit saying it backwards! <clears throat> anyway, 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 anyway. <laughs> okay, <laughs> anyway. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will... He heareth us. His will. Here's where Christianity comes in. The antinomianists just believe and receive. You know, your best life now. Don't worry about sin. Okay? Don't worry about it. Just, just go on. You, you shouldn't probably do that. But don't worry if you do. It's okay. His grace covers it all. Hey, the more you sin, the more grace you get. Okay, we're not under any constraint of any law. We can go ahead and just live as we want to live, just find anything. Okay? Okay? Also, the Pentecostal, God wants you to be happy. God wants you to be wealthy, healthy, and wise. Uh, the last video, I, I believe that was about how Paul went through many <laughs> tribulations. Okay? Okay? Give me a break. See, what God gives us, we are to give unto others. And according to his will. Christianity would have you to covet it all for I, 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 me, me, me. Because it's all about you in Christianity. I, 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 me, me, me. The faith that was once delivered unto the saints. It's all about the Lord. And the daughters of the whore. Calvinism. Antinomianism. Okay. Uh, Mormonism. Uh, Islam. Buddhism. All these isms. It's all about you. It's all about you. And wasn't Tamar and a Amon and Tamar? It was all about him, wasn't it? He was consumed by it, wasn't he? And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask in accordance with his will, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. And if God hates covetousness, but yet Paul tells us to covet better gifts that we may give them unto others, but yet not exalt ourselves. Because remember, Paul, above all people, he could have exalted himself because of all the revelations, but there was given a thorn in his flesh to keep him humble. Okay? You talk to this, some of these Pentecostals. I've cast out some demons. Or imparted them, I should say. Okay, I speak in tongues. I bet you do. Okay. Um, you know, that's not for everybody. <laughs> You're right. You're right. I, not everybody has seen the Lord like I have. You haven't seen anything. You No, no, you've seen something. You haven't seen the Lord. You're deceiving yourself, kid. James 4. James 4. Verses 1 on to verse 10. And we will be done. This wraps it up very nicely. 
Obsess, obsession is not in scripture. I think, I think that using the, the word consumed would be more scripturally appropriate. Even though in the context of scripture that we have seen, it has not been used in that form. But within it, we see with the example that we looked at, in 2 Samuel 13, we saw lust, covetousness, and concupiscence, but also a burning and something that consumed him, and also wrath. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members? Ye lust and have not. Ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war. Yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Just like Amnon. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world as enmity with God. That's how you know that antinomianists are an enemy of God. Because they're friends of the world. They speak of the world, therefore the world heareth them. Okay? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Do ye think the script ow ah bit my tongue. <laughs> Do ye think that the scripture saith in vain the spirit that dwelleth in lust in us Lusteth to envy. Notice that's a lowercase s there. But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith. God resisteth the proud. I'm saved because I just believe. I'm not holding to anything. <laughs> Up the dosage pal. <laughs> Hopefully you got a parachute. Uh, for when you dive off that cliff head first. Okay. A parachute, not a pair of shoes. Okay? But God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. The other, this is referencing, I believe, Proverbs, but um, it says lowly. If you're lowly, you're humble. It's not a contradiction. Okay? Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, which Christianity does not. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You can't resist the devil unless you first submit yourself to God. What God are you submitting yourself to? Which Jesus? The third, the second one? The, the second God in the God of three persons? Or the one who truly is. Which one? Draw nigh to God. And he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners. And purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he shall lift you up. That is going to be it for this little video. Uh, like I said, I'm not being dogmatic on this. If someone wants to be like, well, Brad, I think this is a little bit better. That's fine. That's fine. Okay. I just wanted to share this with you. I mean, this came yesterday while uh, talking to Brother Alexander and sat down and kind of thought about it. It's like, then get home and uh, got into the scriptures and it's like, wow, dude. So, do with this as you will. And like I said, I sent the notes of this onto several saints and not one of y'all said anything. So, anyway, thank you for watching this if you do. I, want, I woke up earlier today to try to get this started earlier, but... Um, when, brother, when I started recording, it was still morning. <laughs> I love you, brother. 
So this is going to take anywhere from four to six hours to upload this. So thank you for watching this. If you do, we love you. Um, do keep in prayer one another. Okay? Keep yourselves in prayer. So we'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.